there's somebody up there? Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today. We come here as your people, Lord. We are here to learn. We're here to seek your will for our lives. We're here to understand more about the things taking place in the world around us. And Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit, who is the one who inspired this book that we call the Bible. May your Holy Spirit uh, get into our hearts. May you help us to understand it, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. The Bible is an interesting book because when you have a look at the Bible and if you were to take the Bible and to split it up, about one third of the Bible is about prophecy, just about prophecy. The other two thirds is a combination of poetry and history and just events that took place. But one third of what you hold in your hands when you hold the Bible is about prophecy. Prophecy is where the Bible talks about events that were to take place in the future. When we have a look at that one third of that Bible that is prophecy, and you look at the different prophecies that have taken place and have been fulfilled through the last few hundred years, and you get down and we find that we find ourselves down and we're left with approximately 5%. Out of that one third of the Bible, 95% of that prophecy has been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. That's better than anything else I know. So we have 5% left when we have a look at the prophecies in the Bible. We're left with about 5% and we can expect 100% accuracy. So when we have a look, especially at the book of Revelation, where it's revealing to us events to take place in the future, and when we put down the Bible to the side, and we have a look on the news, we look on our televisions, on the internet, and we see events taking place around the world, it's got to make us stop and think. Anyone who's maybe over the age of 30 and and getting up there maybe a little bit younger, going up younger, you know, um, we can maybe think the world has changed drastically in the last 15 years. When you have a look at the signs that Christ spoke about with his second coming, and he spoke about an increase in disasters and famines, and even the Bible even speaks about in the religious world that there would be so much deception. You know, it's always a strange thing that, that, as I said here, we have this book called the Bible. There's one Bible, yet there's so many different denominated churches out there. How can you have so many people believing different things starting off with the same Bible? If I was to give each of you an apple seed, I guarantee that everyone will grow an apple tree. But if I was to give a group of people a Bible, how is it that people come up with a different understanding from what the Bible teaches? Is the Bible such a book that it's it's very vague? Or is the Bible very specific? Is it very pointed? And maybe my own preconceptions and ideas can stop me from understanding the Bible. You know, the Bible talks about people having strongholds. A stronghold is something that you hold on to very strongly. It's something that you don't want to let go. So even if you're confronted with something from the Word of God, and this is the only book that claims to be the Word of God. When you think, you think about it, there are many other religious books that people have. They claim to have insight into how to live your lives, how to treat other people, how to do different things. But this book, it also teaches that. It also teaches us how to treat one another, how to live our lives, but it claims to be the very Word of God, the Creator of all things, who has no beginning and no end. So this book is above the other books, but it doesn't just make that claim without having the proof to back it up. The greatest proof that the Bible gives, I believe, is found in that one-third of the Bible, and that's what we call prophecy. 
And that's why when I look at the prophecies and I see those that have been fulfilled already and I see those that are about to take place, and we're going to look at that this morning, when I see those prophecies about to take place, I am so encouraged that I cannot not believe the Word of God. Because it is what it claims to be, because it validates itself, and you don't just look at the Bible, you put the Bible down, and then you look around you at what's taking place in the world. And like, wow, just as the Bible said would happen is the way society, is the way the economy, is the way social issues, is the way the world is going in so many different ways environmentally. One of the greatest events that's maybe quite known to people in the Bible, from people who maybe don't read the Bible, is the event of Armageddon. It's some great event. It's like the finale. It's, it's the thing at the very end, something about to take place. Something that people say is going to involve every single person. I'd like you to turn your Bibles across to Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse 12 down to verse 16. It's in Revelation 16. This is towards the end of the book of Revelation. That we find this event is described, this Armageddon. We know that Armageddon is something big, it's something great, it's something grand. The Bible tells us, beginning in verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty." Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see thy shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Here the Bible talks about there's a great event of Armageddon taking place. You know, it's interesting when you have a look at it. It's always seen to be some worldwide battle. But there's no mention of fighting. You read through that whole passage again. There's no mention of fighting. We have this world Armageddon, but there is something that is mentioned at least two times, and that is that there will be a gathering. I want to read that again. Verse 14, it says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place. The Armageddon, the day of Armageddon, is about a gathering. There's a gathering that is going to take place. Now, at the very beginning of this, it's important to see what are we reading from. The Bible said in verse 12, it says, and the sixth angel, or, 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 or rather it said there, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. This is what is called the sixth plague. It's talking about a plague. Now, the Bible tells us in chapter 17 and verse 1, that there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters the bible's talking about a gathering it's talking about this plague it talks about the judgment of this great whore that sits upon many waters now when you look at the plague the plague is not the gathering but the plague says that the great river euphrates is dried up this is the event that's taking place. This river that was so strong and powerful is suddenly dried up. That's the plague. But the Bible opens up to us behind the scenes to show us what took place first. In order for this river to be dried up, and this is symbolic because the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. It's a book that describes itself. 
In order for this great river, this, the, the, this Euphrates, to be dried up, it must first be gathered together. So the Bible talks to us about how did this river Euphrates become gathered together. Chapter 17, looking at verse 15 down to verse 17, the Bible says this here very clearly. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The water represents nations and tongues and people. This is a worldwide, this is a populated, a population of people. So when you think about this river being dried up, it's almost like the support is being taken away. The Bible tells us what Armageddon is. Do you think about the word Armageddon? It's a drying up of the river Euphrates. Now, Literal Babylon had the river Euphrates running through it. And when Babylon was destroyed, the river Euphrates dried up. This is all in history. King Cyrus came along and he diverted the river Euphrates out of its course. And it dried up and they were able to come into Babylon and they conquered Babylon. That's in a literal sense. But the Bible describes this great whore, and this great whore is what we would call an apostate church. The Bible likens a woman, a pure woman, to a pure church. The Bible also likens an apostate, a harlot, a whore, an impure woman, to an impure church. And it calls this impure woman or this impure church. If you look in verse 18 of chapter 17, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It talks about this woman, this impure church, ruling the kings of the earth. We're looking at quite a powerful entity that's taking place here. And obviously to be so powerful, you need to have the support of the people. But here the Bible says that support is going to be taken away. The river is to be dried up. So what is Armageddon? Some people say that Armageddon is to do with Gideon. Going back right out into the Old Testament, and Gideon had a ba uh, battle in the valley of Jezreel, which is in the area there. But also there, there was no fighting they were blowing trumpets, remember, and they were coming down, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and the Midianites fought each other and they destroyed each other. The word Armageddon comes from the word Harmageddon. The word Ha means mountain. And the word Megiddo is a city that was located at the, mount of foot, at the, at the foot of Mount Carmel, and it means a place of crowds. A place of slaughter. Now, the Bible talks about the mountain of Megiddo as Hamageddon. It talks about a king of Megiddo, the city of Megiddo. There's a plain of Megiddo, an area of land. Now, if you can picture in your mind, you picture Jerusalem is down here. Up here, you have the city of Nazareth where Jesus lived. You have the, the Sea of Galilee. Over here, you have the Jordan River running down to the Dead Sea. And just over here, coming across from the Mediterranean, is Mount Carmel and the region around Mount Carmel. Armageddon has something to do with Mount Carmel. If you've got the valley or the plain of Megiddo, is at the bottom of Mount Carmel. The city of Megiddo is down there. The waters of Megiddo are down there, and there's a mountain right there. What do you think another name for that mountain could be? The mountain 
of Megiddo or Hamageddon. A place, a location. Revelation 16, just turn back to there. When you look at Armageddon, people have given the idea that Armageddon is the world gathering, the armies gathering to a place in the Middle East where there's going to be some great battle and war that takes place. As I mentioned, there's no fighting. When the Bible says there, Revelation 16 and 16, talking about Armageddon, I want to read it again. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So the place the people reach at is called Armageddon. It's a place. Now, what is a place? A location. Location, location, location. You know, it's a place. But there's something else that a place can be. Not just a location, but a situation. Have you ever been between a rock and a hard place? I mean, it's a figure of speech that we use. It's like, well, you know, I was, I was in, I wasn't, my mind wasn't in a good place. You know, I just, well, you know, we use that language. A place is not just a location, but it can be a situation. The Bible is not talking about armies gathering to a location, but it's talking about the world coming into a situation. A worldwide event. Turn your Bible across to Revelation chapter 3. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 3 about a worldwide event. A situation that is going to include every single person in the world. Christian, non-Christian, all alike. In fact, the Bible tells us there, Revelation 3, and looking at verse 10, it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell on the earth. Here the Bible talks about a worldwide event. It's a trial that is going to trial test everybody upon the world. Now you think about it. At the very beginning, there was another time when God had a worldwide test. And in order to facilitate this test, because you've got to understand with God, the Bible tells us that God is love. God does not want us to have to worship Him and serve Him and love Him. He wants us to choose to love him and worship him and serve him. And that's why God uses the element of love. The Bible says, you know, God wants to draw us with loving kindness. He wants us to come to him. He doesn't want to pull us to him. But he wants us to freely come. Now with the principle of love, there has to be the opportunity to not love. So when you think about it, the one time in the history of mankind when God had a worldwide test was in the Garden of Eden. It was very easy. There was only two people. Very easy to facilitate. And what did God do? He placed in the garden hundreds probably, maybe thousands, I don't know, many beautiful trees. The Bible says that all those trees were pleasant to the eyes. They were all good for food. And out of all those trees, he says, you can eat everything that you want. But he says, this one tree, just one. Don't touch it. Don't eat from this one tree. Now, God placed that tree there because he loved mankind. He loved the man and the woman that he had created. And he wanted to give them the opportunity to love him. And so he had to put that tree there because if it was not there, then they couldn't have the opportunity to choose to not love him and obey him. You know, if God says, you know, don't eat from the tree, but I'm putting it on another planet. It's like, well, you know, I can't get to it to choose to not eat from it. You follow this very clear, isn't it? We have to have the opportunity to choose to not love in order to choose to love. So we have this worldwide battle. We're going to find as we study on, God's not going to use a tree anymore. Is God going to pop up trees in so many different countries? So that the whole world has the opportunity to go and not touch. So, well, you know, I want to show my love to God, so 
I'm not going to touch it. But if I can't get to it, that choice is taken away from me. The ability to show true love is taken away. The Bible says there that God's going to have this worldwide trial. Now look at the next verse, verse 11. He says, Behold, I come quickly. You know, this is something that takes place. He says it at the very end of the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, which is talking about the end. He says, Behold, I come quickly. So just before the second coming of Christ, there's going to be a worldwide trial to test everybody in the world. Is this just for Christians? Is it just for those who accept Christ? No, it's not. It's for the whole world. It says, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So even those who say, yes, well, you know, I proclaim my love to Jesus Christ. I had accepted him 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, a year ago. You know, Sometimes words are cheap. God wants to see action as well. Am I going to be faithful and obedient to God? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's just a natural outgrowth, a natural flow from love. If you love me, keep my commandments. A worldwide test where even Christians may lose their crown. by not showing their love to God. The Bible tells us, if we turn across to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, a battle does not have to be physical. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, looking down, verse 4 and verse 5, this is a, a common verse that people will read. It says, For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal or they're not physical, but they're mighty to the pulling uh, through the pull uh, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations or reasonings, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the battle that we're having, it's a battle in the mind. It's not a physical battle with guns and swords and weapons, but it's a battle in the mind. In fact, turn your Bible across to the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible puts it this way. The battle is very clearly in the mind. Romans 7, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. God wants us to serve Him with our mind. God wants us to make an intelligent decision. It's not about emotionalism. Oh, I went to this place and I just felt so emotional and so I decided to follow God. Because you might go somewhere else and another emotion carries you along in a different path. But God wants us to make an intelligent decision. He says those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit, which means with the intellect and in truth. Yes, the heart will follow. He says, if you love me, the love will be there, but we need to make an intelligent decision. We were just mentioning earlier, there's no more intelligent decision than to choose to follow Jesus Christ. I'm talking about, let's just sit the Bible to the side. So we've got no books. We're not looking at anything in the world. We're just thinking logically. Here's the two options. Either God is not true. It's just all a lie. So let's say I choose to follow God, and at the end of my life, I find that God is not true. I've got nothing to lose. I've had a good life. I've been nice to people. Remember, all these different religions tell you how to live and be nice to people and so forth. Nothing to lose. But let's say I choose to reject God and not follow Him, and I get to the end of my life and find out that I'm lost because I've rejected Him. God is true. I lose everything. Choose to follow God. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Reject Jesus Christ, and you have everything to lose. You lose everything. There's greater chance that God is real. Even without, I mean, I'm talking about not even, without even looking at the Bible yet. 
The Bible's talking here about the spiritual battle that takes place. Who are you going to choose to serve? In fact, turn across to chapter 6. We're still there in Romans. Go back to the chapter before. Chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The battle's in the mind. Who am I going to choose to serve and obey? Am I going to serve self and sin, or am I going to choose to serve Jesus Christ and have eternal life? It's decision time. God always brings us to decision time. If you look through the Bible, I find three main points, or really there's more than that, but three main points we find in Exodus Chapter 32 and 26, here we find, you, know, you can turn there if you like, but we find that the people have been worshipping the golden calf. And Moses has come down out of the mountain with the tables of stone, with the Ten Commandments, and he's throwing them down, and he comes down, and then he puts out the cry in verse 26. He says, who is on the Lord's side? Make a decision. You know, none of this, I'm partly here, I'm partly there. You can't because you're nowhere. He says, who is on the Lord's side? Jesus says it in another way. Matthew 12 and 33. You can turn there, Matthew 12 and 33. This is what Jesus says. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For a tree is known by his fruit. He says, make a decision. Make the tree good or make it corrupt. You make the decision. What are you going to choose? In the book of Revelation, we find a choice as well. Here we find that the whole world's going to come to a trial, a choice. What do they choose? Who are you going to serve? What about Mount Carmel? 1 Kings chapter 18, turn across there, looking at verse 21. Here we find that there had been a famine in the land. For three and a half years it had not rained, there'd be neither dew nor rain. Finally, the king's been searching for the prophet Elijah who had said it's not going to rain because God's people had turned away into idolatry. And so God was withholding the rain. And finally, Elijah comes up and he comes up to the king. And he says, let's go up onto Mount Carmel. You bring all your prophets, your false prophets that worship Baal. Worship this stone God that you have created with your own hands. And they can all be there. There was 400, uh, uh, 850 in total of, of these false priests and prophets for, for the god Baal. And they're all up there. And the competition basically was, you see... You put a sacrifice on your altar, and if your God can make it burn, he'll be the true God. But if not, I'll see if my God will do it and see who is the true God. But Elijah said to the people when they get up there, verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people, and he said, How long halt ye between two opinions? How long will you be between two opinions? He says, If the Lord is God, then follow him. If he's not, if it's Baal, then follow him. You know, I say the same thing to all of us. If God is God, then follow him. If he's not, then don't waste your time. But make sure you're making the right choice. If God is God, then follow him all the way. Not just part way. You know, you're waiting for someone, they're making you a cake. You come in part way when they're still adding the ingredients. Say, well, actually, I'll just grab a bit of that now. I'll grab a handful out of, the, out of the mixing bowl. No, you want to wait till they put all the ingredients in and wait till they've cooked it and it comes out and you have a nice cake. Not too sweet. I don't like really sweet cakes. God wants us to have the same experience with Him. Not just a partial experience, it's all or nothing. He says, go all the way in what we're going to do. Here we have on this mountain, 1 Kings, Elijah's there, the prophet of God. You have these false prophets of Baal. There's an apostate woman there, Jezebel. There's the government powers that are involved, the king Ahab. 
you know, all the ingredients that we find in Revelation chapter 13. For those unfamiliar, Revelation chapter 13 basically describes the bad guys in this end of the world. Revelation 14 describes the good guys, God's people, those who are faithful and true to him. Revelation 13 describes those who change God's law, those who try to turn people away from God. Now, what is the core issue? There's this great gathering. Turn across to Revelation 13. I'll just show you this point here that you can see the same scenario as painted. Revelation chapter 13. Those who haven't been through this chapter, it's an important chapter to study. Revelation chapter 13. And looking at verse 3, speaking about this beast. Now, in the Bible, a beast is not something you're going to find at the zoo because this one has seven heads and ten horns and, and it's like a dragon and so forth. A beast is a kingdom. It's an entity. It's an organization that exists in the world. The Bible says it's a kingdom in the book of Daniel. The Bible explains that clearly. The Bible says, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The whole world, this organization, the whole world is just worshiping this organization. In fact, you'd expect to see the head of this organization on Time magazine. Man of the year, this sort of thing, is what you would see. Gathering the world together. To worship the same thing we're finding there in Armageddon, the world being gathered together. The battle of Armageddon is over God's commandments. Revelation 14 says this here, speaking about those on the other side, those who are faithful and true to God. It says there, Revelation 14 and verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Why? Because they love Jesus Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments, he says, John 14, 15. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The battle of Armageddon is over God's commandments, especially the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is to do with the Sabbath. It's the one where God says, remember. It's the one where man says, forget. Man says, God says, remember to keep it holy. Man says, man, let's go play football. It doesn't matter. We can do what we want to do. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day. In Portuguese, that simply means Saturday. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's not your Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. You don't pick when it is and say, well, I'm just going to pick a day and I'm going to have a day off whenever I feel like it. God says the seventh day is a day in order for his people to come and to worship him throughout the world. Now, remember I said... God's not going to place a tree for us to have the opportunity to touch or not to touch. He used that when he had a smaller population. Remember, just two people. Garden of Eden, put a tree there, hey, don't touch it. God's going to use something more sophisticated, yet simple, that everybody in the world has access to. In fact, it's something you can't even hold. It's something you can't even touch that God is going to use to test the whole world. What's the one thing that everybody, regardless of where they live, regardless of their economic standing, their position in society or life, their age, there is one thing that everybody has access to. That is time. God says the seventh day is the Sabbath. You have man comes along and says, no, no, we can worship God on the first day of the week. Yes, we can worship God any day of the week. In my home, we like to have worship every day, morning and evening. Sit down with the children, read the Bible, sing. 
Yes, we worship God every day, but the Bible clearly says when God is looking for corporate worship, that's not just my family, that's your family and the other family and the communities throughout the country and throughout the world to come together to worship the Creator God. God says the seventh day is the day for that. That's when you come together. If you have an appointment to meet the Queen or some famous president or some famous person, you don't dictate when you're going to come. They say, this is when you will come. I will receive you at this date, at this time. God gives us a whole 24-hour period. Sunset Friday night to sunset Saturday evening. God says his holy time. There's a blessing contained in it. In fact, if you keep the Sabbath, your body is going to be younger than your neighbor who doesn't. Because you've rested it. 52 times every year, more. Put away the stress of work and business and school and anything that you have. All the cares of life, just cast them down. Spend time with your family, spend time worshiping God, looking at the beautiful creation that God has made. It's summertime. Isn't it beautiful what God has given to us? God gives the Sabbath as a test. In fact, it's interesting, Ezekiel chapter 13 tells us this. This is what Satan says. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22. Satan always says, it doesn't matter what God says. Do you remember the very beginning there with the tree? And Eve said, hey, you know, God said, don't eat the fruit from that tree or we're going to die. What's the first thing Satan said? Ye shall not surely die. God said, eat, you die. Satan says, eat, you won't die. Look what he says there, verse 22. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hand of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. The devil says, it doesn't matter, you don't have to obey God, you can disobey God. You will still have life. Do what you want. It doesn't matter. You're your own boss. Romans chapter 1. The Bible paints this picture of this worldwide trial. God's going to have a people who are going to be faithful, who are going to witness and stand and say, I'm going to be true and faithful to God no matter. Even though the whole world to a degree is going to support the beast power, in enforcing their Sunday worship. Even though the waters that represented the people, the Euphrates is going to be there, the day will come when it's dried up. The support will be taken away, but it will be too late because that is during the time of the plagues. Romans chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 6. The Bible says this here, By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom ye are also the called of Jesus Christ. God calls his people. He wants us to be faithful among all nations. Here he's talking originally about the church that originated in Rome. Look what he says there, verse 7, to all that be in Rome. The book of Romans, you know it was written to the Romans, don't you? The Christians in Rome, he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. Here he's talking about this church that was faithful. He says, well, you know, you need to be faithful throughout the world. Your faith is spoken of. God wants us to be obedient to keep his commandments among the nations, to be a witness to his name. You know, the Bible tells us, because I said this test is going to be over the Sabbath. I want to show you that in the Bible. Turn your Bible across to Revelation chapter 7. The Bible tells us this here. Revelation chapter 7. 
And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. He says, I'm going to put the seal of the living God in your forehead. In fact, he says there in Revelation chapter 14, he puts it this way. And lo, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with them 144,000, having his father's name in their forehead. So here in the forehead of God's people is the name, the living God. Now it's interesting, the Bible gives so many different names for God. Jehovah, Adonai, the rock the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. All these different names, and you need to take notice when a different name is used. If I was to look at my friend down here, and I'd say, this guy's a plumber. What aspect am I bringing out about him? That he's a plumber. He knows plumbing. He knows all about that. So hey, I'll ring him up and say, hey, you know, as I did the other week, said, hey, I'm doing this here. Can you tell me what to do? And he said, okay, do this. But if I'm just seeing him and I say, hey, and I say, hey, Voter, how are you doing? I might be talking to someone who lives near him. And he's asking me a question in the Bible. I say, hey, look, man, I've got a friend up the road. He's a Bible teacher. He'll come and he'll show you something in the Bible. Depending on what aspect of his character and his abilities I want to bring out will depend on, on how I refer to him. When Jesus is referred to as the rock, we're like, wow, he's something solid, something firm. When we refer to him as the bread of life, you know, here's someone who's going to look after us. When we refer to him as the son of man, the Bible's saying, you know, he's, he was like us. He, he experienced hunger and pain and sadness. He's touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. But when the Bible says he is the son of God, don't forget he is divine. He is not exactly as us. He is still God. Yes, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he is still God. So when the Bible says the living God, the question I ask is what type of God is a living God? It doesn't say the dead God. It doesn't just say the God. A living God. What type of God is a living God? Turn your Bible across to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I love the book of Acts. There's so many amazing things taking place. Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas have gone into Lyconia. And there was a man there, an unfortunate man. And they healed him. Now became a fortunate man. They came and they healed him. The people saw him and they're like, wow, this guy's leaping up. He couldn't walk before. He's leaping and running. And the people are like, wow, the gods have come down to us. And they said, one must be Mercurius and the other one, Jupiter. And they start to get ready to worship them. Setting up an altar and looking at verse 15, Paul goes in the midst of them and says, Sirs, sirs, why do you these things? We're men of like passions as you are, and we preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Don't worship us, we're just men. Worship the living God. But look at the description. What type of God is the living God? Read the rest of the verse. That you should turn unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. The living God made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all things that are therein. Turn your Bible across to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, as I said, Revelation 13 describes the bad guys. Revelation 14 describes God's people because God is not going to allow the bad guys to get out there without a message going out that all God's people may hear and may follow. God's voice. Revelation 14, here is the message that is given. In fact, there's three messages. Verse 6 tells us where this message is to go. 
And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Remember, Armageddon is gathering the whole world. Remember, so many, the whole world's trying to, they're trying to get the whole world to worship the beast. So God has a message going out to the whole world. And he says, don't worship the beast and, 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 and come away from the beast. But the first thing he says there is in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. Worship God. But if I was to ask you the question, who does it say to worship? And you said, God, that's a good answer. But I like really good answers. There's a better answer because the Bible says worship him. So you say the answer is it says to worship him. My next question is who is him? Look what the Bible says there. Revelation 14 verse 7. And worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters the same him is the same one described as a living god the god who created the heavens the earth the sea and the fountains of waters there's one other place in the bible in fact there's two it mentions it in psalms as well but there's one other main place where we find the same phrase in the bible turn your bible across to exodus chapter 20 and let's look down from verse 8 exodus chapter 20 looking down from verse 8 the bible is very clear on this this is beyond refutation. No one can refute this. Exodus chapter 20. And I'm bold in saying that, not because I know anything or have anything, but because, well, it is because I know something and have something. It's because I have the word of God. Don't believe it from what I say. Believe from what the Bible says very clearly. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, Thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days. Now, when the Bible says, do you see the word for there at the beginning of verse 11? For. The word for, you could easily put the word because. So here God says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, don't work, you, you don't want to worship me. And then he says, because, this is the whole reason why. God wasn't just thinking, oh yeah, have a day off, I just want you to, here's why. He says, for, in six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. We call that the creator. God says, I have created all things. I want you to worship me. It's a sign of you worshiping me as the creator of all things. These people have the seal of God. They have the seal of the living God, the seal of the creator. Now, the Bible talks about a mark of the beast. People have heard about that. It's a mark that you can get in your right hand or in your forehead. It's not a computer chip. It's not a barcode. It's nothing like that. When the Bible talks about your forehead, it's talking about accepting something mentally. When it talks about your hand, the Bible says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. It's about your action, what you're going to do. When the Bible talks about the seal of God, you can't get it in your hand. You only get it in your forehead. God wants to put the Sabbath in our forehead. The rest, not because it gives us a day off, but because it's a time not for you and for me, even though we've benefited greatly by it. But it's a time for us to acknowledge and worship God as the one true creator. This has been from the beginning of time. Even though people have come along and said, no, no, it's another day. No one can give you one reference in the Bible to say that Sunday should be kept as a holy day. It's not in there. I'll give them my house. There's nothing there. It doesn't exist. How does this gathering take place? Turn your Bible back to Revelation chapter 16. God will gather his people as his message goes out. But the devil wants to gather the world to him, to defy God in all that they do. 
The Bible tells us, Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behind the scenes. That which was that which brought the waters together, which brought the people together to give their support to the beast. It says behind that was the dragon, was the beast, and the false prophet. Unclean spirits working miracles. The beast is Catholicism. The false prophet is apostate Protestantism. Most people who are Protestant in profession don't even know what they're protesting about. They would have absolutely no idea of the history of their church and where they stepped out of Catholicism because they decided they wanted to follow the Bible, going back into the Reformation, going back to Martin Luther and Zwingli and so many other reformers who said the church of the day would start it off pure, the church that began in Rome. It started off pure, the Bible tells us we read in Romans 1. But then the Bible says it'd be a falling away. It would apostatize and turn away, and they would do away with the Bible and make up their own doctrines. Horrendous things to believe. And Martin Luther said, let's get back to the Bible. And so all these Protestant churches that stemmed out of there claiming to follow the Bible, but they've all gone back. They have apostatized themselves. They no longer follow the Bible. That's why you have one Bible, one apple seed, but so many different trees. Such a variety because they have gone off from the clear teaching of the Word of God. What about the dragon? If you think within the world, you think of Protestantism. God says throughout Protestantism and in Catholicism, his people are in there. We're not knocking a church or any churches, but God says that's his people in there. He wants them to come out of a false system of belief, a false system of worship. That encompasses a large portion of the world. But what about all these people that aren't Christian, that aren't Catholic? What about all these other ones? He says the dragon. The dragon is talking about spiritualism. It is something that is involved in basically every religion. Spiritualism. Spiritualism, what does it teach? You look at ancestor worship that you have in so many cultures. You go around the world... They'll have, I was speaking with someone uh, uh, just, just, just a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying that in their culture, um, that they're going to be having a, a thing. They've got to go there, and there's a, a shrine in the house where the ancestors are put, and they have to go and do a prayer there. And the person was saying, you know, they can't do that because they know it's not true. Because the Bible teaches that when someone dies, they're resting in the grave waiting for the resurrection. The Bible refers to it even as Jesus did. It's asleep. That's why we'll put on the grave. Rest in peace. They're awaiting the resurrection. They're not sitting up there in some bodiless form, floating around, watching the misery on the earth. They're sleeping. And the Bible says they'll hear the voice of Jesus Christ when he comes with the trumpet of God, and he'll say, Awake, awake, you that sleep in the dust of the ground. Rise up into immortality, incorruption, never to die again, to be set at one again with your loved ones. I would not be happy in heaven if I was killed tomorrow, sitting there watching my family on the earth. Wouldn't bring me joy at all. Spiritualism. 1848. Three sisters. 
they heard some rappings in the house they lived in. Hydesdale, New York. The Fox sisters they were known as. Leah, Margaret, Kate. And they started knocking back and they, and they set up this communication and said, well, we're communicating with a dead person. And they worked out and, 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 and they started, well, this is a person who was killed in this house many years ago and, and their body is buried in the bottom and this is, is what's known. If you, if you Google it, it's there. This is one of the events known as the birth of modern spiritualism, which has crept into churches as well. Trying to communicate with the dead is not possible. The devil gets behind. He'll have loved ones come and say, hey, and they'll tell you something different to the word of God because the devil does not want you to believe this book. He wants to gather the world into deception. Whether working miracles, impersonating the dead, performing magic, whatever he can do, he wants to distract us from being faithful and true to God. There's a test that's coming on the whole world. Regardless of where you've been or where you're going, God has a plan where he wants you to go. Not into nothingness and destruction, but into eternal life. Not eternal life like we have here now, with pain and misery and suffering, but a place where there is no more death. There's no more pain. There's no more hurt. There's no more sorrow. There's only joy, peace, pleasure, as God had given to us at the beginning. He doesn't want us to be gathered up with those supporting the beast in the Armageddon that's going to drop anyway. The waters will be dried up. But he wants his people to stay and stand faithful and true to him in all things. Yes, we'll come into a place called Armageddon where each one of us must make a decision. Am I going to be true and faithful to God? He died for me. Will I die for him? I hope you've enjoyed the message that you've just watched. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or maybe there's other things you'd like to learn about, just feel free to contact us. You can call or you can text on 02 811 85483 or just check out the website below.